Texas Lutheran University. simple materials in order to purify water. So please help me in welcoming the Texas A&M Colonius Project. Good morning. Good morning. A colonia is an unincorporated community that lacks water, sewage, and one or more other infrastructures. We were mandated about 22 years ago to find out what it was. Nobody had any idea how many, nobody had any idea where, how. So we kept it very simple. It's an unincorporated community that lacks water, sewage, and one or more other infrastructures. Unfortunately, it was more often than not that there was more than one infrastructure that was missing from these colonias. What ended up happening was that um, we had some unscrupulous developers that started um, I'm going to start playing laser tag with this. <laughs> um, that started selling the American dream, always promising the poorest of the poor that they would get utilities. Now, tell me what bank is going to lend money on raw land that doesn't even have a home in it unless it's got utilities. None. None whatsoever. So these same developers started financing the American dream. Some they get fancy, but most often than not, this is what colonial residences look like. You know how much they were being charged to finance these homes? At least 25% interest. 25% interest to the poorest of the poor, the working poor. We have 2,333 colonias identified along the Texas border. The border now becomes a little bit harder to decipher because now we have six different definitions for border. It used to be that it was only those counties that were contiguous to the Rio Grande. Then it was 25 miles from the border, 75 miles from the border, and now the border is being described almost in all six of those definitions as 150 miles from the border. Can you imagine that? A 150 mile wide border between Mexico and the United States. Unfortunately, 
what started to happen is that we started finding more colonias, more unincorporated communities that lack water and sewage, the most basic of infrastructures all over. We even got a call from Travis County. Austin, Texas can't be, cannot be. No, there aren't any here. Well, we started counting, there was one big one. Now all of a sudden we have satellite colonias that have no water, no sewage in Travis County, our state capital. The more we look, the more we find. And that's what they look like. Because we have no water, no sewage. And we have a catch-22 situation with the um, counties because they base their development of infrastructure on a tax base. What kind of tax base can they get out of homes like these? We estimate that we have half a million people living in colonias. Half of them are under the age of 18. Which definition are we gonna use? The broader the definition, that number is gonna rise. And we don't know because we haven't had enough resources to take time to start counting. At best, we can give you estimates. There are no building codes. There are no construction rules for rural communities, nowhere. So they get built as they, as they can afford the materials. The catch-22 comes in that it, even if the county were to provide services or provide infrastructure, the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna make sure that the house is built up to code. Any of these houses look like they were built to code? No. So it's just a revolving door that keeps happening. Where do we start? What we started doing is helping communities learn how to navigate the different systems, whether it's a school system, the municipal system, the city, the county, the state, the national. We're teaching people how to navigate the systems so that they can start making a difference in their communities. Part of what we do constantly is survey the communities. We hear about stereotypes and we hear the myth. You know, those people just don't care about their health. They don't even buy insurance. Um, they're always sick and it goes on and on and on. So we took one county in South Texas that has the highest population of colonias. They have almost 700 colonias in one county. We interviewed 2,000 families. Look at what the top seven concerns, express concerns are. Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, vision care, computer literacy, women's health, ESL, dental health. Health, 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 health. So what we did is that we overlapped using GIS tracking, we overlapped 2,000 families that we had interviewed. Access in the colonias is considered anything that's within two mile walking distance is what we consider access because you don't have public transportation in rural communities. They have to get to water because they have to buy it in town or there's pumping stations that they can, they can use to go get it. So what we did with this GIS track is that after we plotted all of the people that we interviewed, the mean distance to any service provider, medical service provider, whether it's optometrist, a dentist, or doctor, the mean distance was 0.63 miles. The mean distance for 2,000 families living in Colonias is less than a mile, yet we have people do not, that do not get services. What's the first thing that gets asked to you when you go to a doctor or a medical service provider? Very first question. Yeah, do you have insurance? Now, if I have Blue Cross Blue Shield, I mean, I'll, you know, I'm pretty sure I'll get a, uh, an appointment within a week, 10 days maybe at the most, but I'll get an appointment. When you say I've got Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, 
you'll be lucky if you get an appointment in a month, two months, three months. So a lot of service providers have found ways of saying no without saying, ever saying that word. Yeah, we'll get you an appointment in, this is October, December. My glasses are broken right now. My teeth hurt right now. Now we have agencies going, well, I wonder why people don't want to sign up for Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP. I wonder why. I wonder why. So we learn, we teach how to navigate that system. If we have to complain, we're going to complain. If we have to make it work, we're going to find a way to make it work. Look at how many hospitals were in this study group. Seven. Seven. And these hospitals often get crammed with non-emergency patients in their emergency rooms. I wonder why. Our surveys in our community health workers are the pulse, the heart of our organization. We have children's activities, all kinds of children's activities. You know, culinary school was a blast. They were a um, local high school that always wanted to produce our menus for any activities that we had, whether they were after training, um, after our training academies, any kind of training session, they were ready to start cooking for us. Guess what the first thing that the parents requested after we finally got water to one of our centers? They started their own garden, a little bit at a time. Food bank, great partner. We're a food pantry up and down the border. We have three different regions. We have one in, in El Paso, we have one in Laredo, one in the Valley, and we're starting one right here in, in San Antonio. But not only do, do we serve as a food pantry, we have nutritionists and cooks, partnerships that we give them a bag that the food bank issues and says, can you produce food? Can you, how many meals can you produce out of this bag? So what ends up happening is that not only are we sharing recipes with uh, colonial residents, now we can feed, give feedback to the food banks as far as what works, what doesn't work. I remember the first time that we traded cooking oil for olive oil, and it was like, it comes in a can. <laughs> yeah, but that can's worth like $23 because it was huge. We had training classes. The food was extra delicious, extra better. Elders come in for different classes. We have different times. We, we don't have too many centers. We only have 42 that run from border, from El Paso all the way to Brownsville. But the centers get used at different times by different groups. This is smack in the middle of the, of the day for the elders because the kids are all in school. Mom, moms like to come to class. We don't have the best of visuals, so we make our own. We're talking about diabetes here. During the day, while the kids are in school, moms and, and the elders can come and use the center. Not only do we talk about prevention and diets, we actually let everybody know what those numbers mean. There is no such thing as a little bit of diabetes. You got it, you don't. And this is how you find out. And we talk about numbers. We tell stories all the time. And believe it or not, Laredo, Texas, at one time had a ice hockey team. A what? <laughs> yeah, Laredo had an ice hockey team. They heard about the Colonias program. They decided that one game out of each season, they were going to have a book. You turn in a book to the Bucks, the ice hockey team, and they let you in. But the books were for us. Our libraries are jam-packed with books because 
Not only did the ice hockey team do this annually, we found out that the libraries, now that they are electronically replacing books, they don't have a place to put the books that have been electronically uh, replaced. We know, we know where, we have libraries too. Community emergency response. We have people that are being trained almost constantly because during emergency preparedness, emergency responses to natural disasters, everybody thinks about the huge, the bigger numbers. And it's obvious, I mean, obviously you concentrate on the urban places where there is the highest number of people living. But who takes care of the rural communities? We do. We train local communities. Look at that. A bike cemetery. At least that's what it looks like. Every year, Aggies walk away, graduated, brand new degree, and that's how many bikes they collect every single year. The school has a process. They, they cut up all the chains. They put it away. They've got to wait till September. Aggies have to come back and identify their bikes. Once that happens, anything that's left over, right about this time, they start posting that bikes are going to be auctioned off. Well, we had a community that said, we want them all. Told our story, and they just said, well, we want them all. So well, what are you going to use them for? He says, we had been trying to develop a program of community involvement something that allows everybody to work, produce, do for their, their communities. They decided that they would get as many volunteers to recondition, refurbish the bikes. And by consensus, they said for every 10 hours of community service that, that's provided to the city, the county, the colonias, they can come in and choose a bike. Over 60,000 hours of community service were produced. 60,000 hours. Even if you multiply 60,000 by the minimum wage, eight bucks, that's $480,000 worth of work. Volunteer groups often use a much higher number, but imagine the rate of return on $3,000 investment for the group. Of course, it involved the National Guard, the Army Reserve, bunch of firefighters, policemen, and all of the law enforcement groups came to work. The band decided that they wanted to be part of it. It's all about learning how to use the system, how to navigate it, and how we're going to allow them to decide how it's going to produce. Even, even the sister city in Mexico benefited from this because they ended up getting the last 250 bikes. Who would have known? So, the next speaker will be Maria Alejandro, and she is our program coordinator for development. And she's going to be talking to us, sharing uh, information about the AM Training Academy. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Oscar, for um, setting the tone. And I'm sure everybody has a little bit of an understanding of what the built environment looks like in the colonias. I'm going to talk a little bit about our community's greatest asset, which is our human capital, our people. The mission of the Colonias program is to help conceive, develop, and deliver solutions to increase the quality of life and built environment for the, for the residents in the Colonias. We use an asset-based approach to community development, meaning we go in and look for the assets. We don't go in as a needs-based approach, but rather what is in the community and what can we cultivate um, in the community. Um, as Oscar mentioned, our community outreach workers are really the ones steering, you know, all of the activity here on the ground. 
So um, what we do is when we have residents that want to play a role in their community, a leadership role, um, we invite them to apply for the training academy. And what the training academy does is that it enhances the capacity of the community residents to serve as promotoras and community outreach workers. All of that work that you've seen in some of the pictures are led by community outreach, outreach workers, which are residents, mostly residents of the colonias, mothers, grandmothers, parents, dads. So the colonias um, undergo, through the training academy, a Texas Department of State Health Services certified curriculum with eight core competencies. And these are the competencies um, in the, in the, pro, in the uh, training academy for certification, communication skills, advocacy skills, organizational skills, interpersonal skills, service coordination skills, and then knowledge-based specific health topics. So when somebody, when, when you have a curriculum regarding diabetes or heart health or um, you know, anything around that area, we have specific topics where like for the picture that Oscar showed you earlier with the woman uh, providing a diabetes education um, training. We have 24 uh, curricula plus we have three under review and these are certified by the Texas Department of State Health Services. Here you get a little idea of some of the curricula and some of the um, trainings and the capacity building that the promotoras undergo. Currently, um, with Texas A&M Colonia's program, we have 12 certified instructors and 31 certifies, certified promotoras and community outreach workers. Now, the term community outreach workers, promotoras, community health workers, they're interchangeable. So what do they do? Basically, we go into the community or they go into the community and conduct community assessments. We do not, as a program, come in and say, well, you know, I think you need this. No, we rely on the pulse on the ground by the leaders on the ground. So the promotoras or the community outreach workers go to the communities which are very, um, they're located in rural, remote areas. They're not always easy to get to because they don't have paved roads. Um, and as you can see, some around here, you know, there's puddled water. In some areas, when you're going in, it's, it's mud. It's just flat out mud. Um, even when the kids are getting picked up from, uh, on the school bus, sometimes the parents have to take them out to the highway to get picked up by the school bus because they cannot, the school buses will not go in. So they trek through wherever they need to, to get to the community to find out what the, what the needs are, what is it that they're looking for in their community. They also serve as cultural mediators between their communities and programs and services. Here um, you see a, a community health worker working with a family around WIC, um, how to get services and how to access um, uh, WIC benefits. Oscar touched on the uh, certified emergency response training. So in the colonias, uh, they're not at the top of the list in case we have an emergency of some sort. So the community outreach worker said we need certified emergency response training. They go into the communities, they not only train adults, but they also train children. And there is a story about in Sabata County when um, there was a natural disaster, I think it was a hurricane, and um, the, the fire chief was stuck in Chicago and could not fly out. So who took the lead? The promotoras, the community outreach workers. They went over to the judge, and they got the keys to the center where they were gonna evacuate people to. They organized the entire evacuation in an orderly fashion. By the time the fire chief came home, everything was under control. So it's pretty impressive when you think about it. 
We'll work with children. Children. Um, sometimes we have summer uh, camps in the centers or after school programs. As you can imagine, living in rural areas, you don't really have access. If you're going to school, if you live in the colonias and you're going to school in the urban area, you're going to have to ride the bus back home. So most of the time, you will not have the opportunity to participate in extracurricular activities or anything like that. So the centers step in and coordinate some of these activities. Here are some of the community health fairs, nutrition classes. Um, I, let me see if I have the, I'll show you the map in a second where from El Paso all the way to Brownsville, there are 42 community resource centers. At these resource centers is kind of, they serve as the hub for a lot of these activities. So here you see um, uh, mothers having a nutrition class. And then remote, more recently, because we have uh, the WIC program, we have several community outreach workers working with WIC, they decided, well, you know, if, we're, if they're using WIC to buy some of their, of their food, what about having nutrition classes using the items that you can purchase with, with WIC. And nowadays, you can purchase uh, a lot more fresh foods with WIC. So they conduct nutrition classes, and they're sort of taking the lead on this, and we're sharing it with the state office, who is very, very uh, impressed with their efforts. Another community uh, health fair. Oops. Here's a family fitness challenge. This was actually in San Antonio. As Oscar mentioned, um, the changing definitions of the border are extending the border 150 miles inland. So we are expanding our work accordingly. Whoops. The book drive, Oscar mentioned about the book drive. There you go. <laughs> Summer activities for kids. Look at these kids running. This is just one area. Remember, we're covering from El Paso all the way to Brownsville, 42 community resource centers. So multiply that times that geographical area. Who does college night in the colonias? Well, the community outreach workers said, we need to have college night for our kids too. They can't often go into the city where, or the urban area to participate in college night. So they organized, they spoke to the regional director, this is in Laredo, and they organized a college night for the kids. And it was well attended by both representatives of uh, colleges and universities and um, families. Holiday festivities great time of year. Um, each of the, of the directors in each of the regions, the three regions, um, coordinate um, gift drives and a shoebox drive. So whatever you can fit into a shoebox gets decorated and dispersed amongst all the children. Here's the map. So um, you saw this earlier in Oscar's presentation. Each of those dots represent a community resource center. But look at the geographical span and then add to it the layer that these are very rural communities. They usually don't have access to potable water, electricity, storm drainage, sewage, and nowadays internet activity, I mean internet connectivity. Oops. So, Continued um, training for the promotoras. Um, it's a natural fit to talk about servant leadership with the promotoras because they are already, um, they already are servant leaders. You know, our, our community is rich with servant leaders. So how do we define servant leadership? The servant leader is a servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve serve first, then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. So if you notice, 
from you know, telling the story about how the community outreach workers are residents from the areas, yet they felt compelled to do something in their community. Think about how we get up in the morning and we're, you know, we have to go to school, we have to go to work, and we do you know, things in our community as well, but we're not dealing with the same kind of challenges that they are. We're not dealing and having to haul water from somewhere um, or things like that. So they're pretty, pretty amazing uh, leaders. The principles of servant leadership, listening, which is the hardest thing you'll ever do in your entire life, and you will be learning how to do that forever. Really, really, truly listening. So as a program, we don't, again, we don't go in and say, well, this is what you need, and I think, and no, we're listening to them first. Empathy, awareness, stewardship, building community, and clearly, they have commitment to others. So we're working on building the, the curriculum for this to implement it pretty soon. So in short, or in conclusion, the Texanum Colonias program has a cadre of community outreach workers. They strengthen the social infrastructure of the Colonias and rural communities to make sure that a wealth of resources is available to their residents. And just one more beautiful picture of um, our graduates from the training academy. And um, now I'd like to, you know, since we're talking about the social infrastructure here, and we're talking about the challenges of water, I'd like to introduce to you Marisa Munoz, she is a native Texan and is coming to us through the University of British Columbia. And she's going to talk to you about the water filtration project in the colonias. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Marisa Munoz. I first want to appreciate uh, my two colleagues who really kind of set things up nicely. I want to appreciate you for coming out this morning. Uh, thank you for being so attentive an audience. Um, like Maria mentioned, um, I'm originally from Texas. I grew up in Laredo, Texas, and so that's my hometown. That's always my frame of reference is the border. Um, I did my master's degree at Texas A&M University, and that's something that I'm going to speak to you a little bit about. Um, but you can see where I am right now. I'm working on my PhD at the University of British Columbia. So being in Vancouver, Canada gives me quite a different border experience um, to be on the Canadian side, looking at the Canadian-U.S. border, um, and to be familiar with a hometown that straddles the U.S.-Mexico border. What I'd like to talk to you about is the Texas A&M uh, water project that was... Um, we worked, I worked on it through uh, the Colonias program, and that's how I first kind of came to understand the work that we were doing. Uh, and it eventually, the work that I was doing um, with the program, uh, eventually turned into my master's thesis. And so I'd like to um, share some of those ideas with you. So first of all, the project itself, um, it's an interdisciplinary and a transdisciplinary a project, meaning that we had folks from across all different kinds of faculties and communities that would come and become involved with the water project. What's really distinct about this project is that the community work and what was happening in the Colonias program uh, and in the actual communities and the centers themselves is what in turn informed academic work. Now this is really different than how most things happen at institutions, academic institutions. For the most part, there's some kind of funding available. A professor is interested in uh, what that funding can be applied to. They develop a program. They have a proposal. They decide what it is that they want to be able to put forward into communities. They try to find communities to work with. It's generally that the academic institution shapes the kind of research that happens in that institution. But in this case, we had something really different happening in that the Colonia program has been around for a really long time. 
Um, and what started to happen is that the work that they were doing in that community um, started to attract a bunch of folks that were across different faculties. Um, and I'll kind of tell you how that happened. But what's most important is the idea that um, as we move forward, right, in the academic institution, we can look outside of that institution for the kind of work that inspires our research and our careers. So in this case, everything began with Filter Fridays. Filter Fridays were a really informal get-together um, of folks that came from the communities. We had different artists that came in. We had folks from different faculties, including engineering, myself, education. We had folks from the art department uh, with some ceramics background. And what we started to do was just share ideas about water in general and the idea that there are some um, projects that happen in rural areas and projects that are happening in other countries and there's different kinds of skills that we can put forward to really understanding and trying to find solutions for the water shortage issues. And what it is that we were particularly interested in were the open source point of use ceramic water filter projects that are happening in different parts of the world. Now if we look at that um, open source means that it's non-proprietary. There's instructions that you can find on the internet, and there's folks that are really willing uh, to teach um, how to make ceramic water filters. Point of use means that it would happen in each particular household, and it was the potential that the work that we were doing could actually influence and bring water to a single family um, to help them uh, with their access to clean water. Uh, and ceramic water filters, ceramic being something that is renewable, it's accessible in lots of different communities, and it, for the most part, is a low technology kind of um, solution. So what I'd like to do is just take a moment, and when I say open source, I want to acknowledge the different teachers that we've each learned from. You can see, here we go, in the genealogy of teachers, I'm way down here at the bottom. But what I'd like to do is um, turn around and really acknowledge the three folks that put it together at Texas A&M University are Dr. Stephen Carpenter, Oscar Munoz, who presented first, uh, and Dr. Brian Bollinger, and each of them working in a different faculty. They were the folks that really started Filter Friday, and I came along after they had this thing going. Their teachers were Manny Hernandez and Richard Wukic, who worked with Potters for Pieces, where they learned the original technology um, and as you'll see, it's a technology that changes from community to community. And the fact that it's an informal teaching and that it happens in all different kinds of settings is what I was most interested in as an educator. So I started to really pay attention. Who's teaching? How are they teaching? What's going on at these Filter Fridays? Now, Potters for Peace borrowed um, the major idea from one of the um, professors that's down in Nicaragua. His name is Fernando Mazariegos. He's an inventor. And what he decided to do in his, rural, his own rural community is he decided to put together whatever resources were available to try to figure out the ceramic point of use water filter that could help single individual families have access to clean, potable, healthy water. Um, so what we started to do, oh, I'm going backwards. Let's see. Sorry. Here we go. What we started to do was invent our own methodology. Like I said, in academic institutions, oftentimes you have ideas that start at the institution and work their way down to the community. Well, we were a community that were wanting to inform academia. And so what we had to do is invent our own steps for how that was going to happen. We started by really listening to what the communities need. And the need was for water. Whether they have infrastructure, whether they have a, an old infrastructure, whether it's really not working for them, a lot of the families in our state um, use really large tanks. And trucks will come by and refill their tank for daily household use. We're talking about for cooking, for washing, for everything that you need in the house. And so when we started to pay attention, that water was really one of the primary concerns. It's something that they have to solve almost every day. It's something that they really have to pay attention to. Um, then we decided to figure out what are the skills that we have that can, we can put forward to um, address those needs. That's when we decided to get together for Filter Fridays. And like I said, it was really informal. Two o'clock to five o'clock or so, we would all go to um, Dr. Carpenter's house. Oftentimes we would hang out in his garage because he, had, he was a ceramist and he had some equipment. And we'd kind of figure out, well, if we do it like this and if we do it like this. And 
through that process, it was a lot of informal conversations. It kind of pushed forward um, the direction of the project. What we started to do in those conversations was to theorize and to translate common community vocabulary to how we might be able to understand it within the academy. So for my part in particular, as an educator, I wanted to figure out how is it that people are teaching each other this? How is it that we're letting learning happen in these different contexts? And so I was able to take what was happening in the community and translate it into an academic research project. And because we were getting together, the more folks that we talked with, whether it was engineering, whether it was education and humanities, whether it was at community health events, um, we started to really gain the support, both financial and uh, logistical, um, and a lot of different programs that were willing to partner with us. So there's really quite uh, a network of partnerships that happen to support this kind of project. Um, each of these is a place-based solution, and I'm just going to start to move a little more quickly. I know that what you're really interested in is probably the water filters. The way that this is taught that I find really interesting is that it's a really loose, suggested process. These are the basics. You're going to take 50% of a locally sourced clay, 50% of a local organic matter. That can be coffee grounds, that can be rice husks, that can be untreated sawdust. Whatever happens to be local and plentiful and of small particulate size, you form a filter. And that can take a lot of different forms. Some of them look like top hats. Some of them look like tall cones. Some of them are just what you can fit into a bowl. You fire the thing to 900 centigrade. And you look for a, pora a porosity um, that will pass one liter of water per hour. These are just the loose basic guidelines. And from this loose basic guideline, there's a lot of trial and error. And like I said, it changes from place to place. So it's never going to look exactly the same. There's never a one step, two step, three step. It's always a matter of figuring out how to follow these loose guidelines and what's, what's going to work or what's not going to work. For us, this is what it looked like. This is. Um, a cone press that was kind of jimmy rigged together. It's a lot of MacGyvering to figure out what resources we have available. So we were using a concrete press and mold. Um, right outside of the frame is a car jack that we would actually use to press um, the clay down. Uh, and it was a lot of trial and error to try and figure out, OK, well, if we're in College Station, what are our local materials? What might this look like here? Uh, and then we had some students come in and design and build the press for us. And the first press didn't work so well. We broke it. Second press worked better. Then we started to really play with, as more people got involved, what are the different ways that we could press out filters? Like I said, we were in a garage. And you can start to see that there's just little pieces that we are trying to put together. And over on the right-hand side is one of the, um, the wet filters. It goes through a process of air drying, and then you have to solve the process of how do we fire this thing to 900 centigrade. Now, at night, you can see my, um, my dad here, um, 2012. Let me, let me back up here. This is a filter Friday in 2009. And the process has continued and taken many different evolutions in each different place that it goes to. So even though we were in College Station here, this is what our filters looked like. A few years later, um, Mr. Munoz had the chance to travel to Bolivia, work with a bunch of rural communities there. And you can see the filter that uh, resulted was quite different in that he pressed it into a, a bowl to get that same form. And what he's checking here is the porosity, how slowly the liquid, uh, the water is able to filter through. So each different place is going to have a different set of solutions to how to make the water filter work in that particular place. So as an educator, um, I was interested in the fact that this is community-led learning. Um, we listen to the community members, and it's the idea that we're working with a community instead of on a community. And we're working for them in their best interests. It wasn't so much about how many papers we could publish or how many grants we could apply for. That speaks to academia. It's about how many families are we really going to be able to have increased access to water because of the work we're doing? How do we get um, elders and children and young people? And how do we involve the brick maker and the ceramist? And how do we involve, um, oh, we have a whole abundance of coffee grinds here. How do we 
make sure that we use this and how can we put these things to productive um, use. And the second part that's really important is that um, not only are we accountable to each other, but we remain accountable to the communities that we're invested in. It means where we teach and where we help people have that access, it's not a hit and run. We stick around and we make sure that it's something that can change and works for them and it's never in the interest um, of the institution necessarily or of the program necessarily. It's about how do we make these things work for the community um, because it's theirs and we're there to be of service to them. Uh, it also centers local knowledge and resources. So instead of ever saying rural communities, you know, they're deficit, those folks live in poverty, it's really difficult, all of the stereotypes that are often perpetrated by the media, we want to really center that there's quite a lot of local knowledge um, of, that comes from experience and understanding. And we wanted to interrupt a pattern that seems to happen where academia goes into different communities, they'll write papers, they take credit for the work that's happening, and then they walk away with intellectual property rights, which is something that most communities won't be familiar with that phrase, intellectual property rights, but as academicians, when you put your name on a publication, you get credit for those ideas. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we share that property, we share those rights, we share um, the richness that comes from communities with those communities. So it interrupts a little bit of the way that uh, knowledge is commodified in institutions. And like Maria shared, um, it's very much the strength-based approach. What are the resources and knowledges that we, can, that we can tap in each different community instead of relying on stereotypes? So the way that I was able to inform uh, the Academy is that I wrote a master's thesis that was called the Tamu Water Project, Critical Environmental Justices Pedagogy. And writing my master's thesis was a little bit of a backwards process in that I was reading and reading and reading and trying to figure out where in the field of education this work fit. So the three that I came up with was pedag uh, critical pedagogy, place-based pedagogy, and environmental justice. And then what I started to do is really dig deeper and figure out, well, what are the criteria in this academic theory of environmental justice, critical environmental justice, that this community project really seems to reflect? And so my, the basic premise of my master's thesis is not only to document the amazing work that was happening with the water project, but also to really make space within the academy to recognize that this community-led learning is really quite powerful and quite uh, worth paying attention to. Uh, after the fact, I was able to work with the Colonias program later on um, as a curriculum writer. And so what I did is I developed a week-long water camp, uh, anticipating about five-hour days. It's a modular curricula, meaning that you can use some lessons, not use some lessons. You can pick and choose uh, in the lineup. It was entirely place-based and focused on the El Paso, Texas uh, region, meaning that I used all of the U.S. Geological Survey information about their particular watersheds, and I built a curriculum um, based on that particular um, community. And I used an art and science framework. And what I'd really like to impress is that as we do our research, we have to consider ways um, that we can give back to the communities that are enabling us in our academic lives, right? So what I wanted to be able to do is to gift this curricula back to the community. And we were able to run a couple of different programs uh, using the curricula, and I have both the student version and I have the teacher version, and um, it's still in use today, which feels pretty nice. Uh, and it's middle grade science, uh, which is my own personal professional teaching background. I taught sixth grade science for a few years, so that could be scaffolded up or down. Um, and what felt really good is that even though I've stepped away from the classroom of having my own, my own classroom, that I can still contribute uh, my skills in this way. So what I'd really like to impress is that as we consider the idea of environmental justice, we have to really be critical of how we define justice. So when I think of justice, justice work as, it's not research, but it's we search and the idea that we can definitely turn to communities as our source of knowledge and really work with them to help and give back um, to those communities that have nurtured us. And I'd like to leave um, one particular reference that might be worth looking into. Kirkness and Barnhart suggest the four R's of research. Now, whereas uh, the original article speaks to Native Americans in higher education, I think that it's 
a set of values that most definitely speak to any community or group of students or um, group of learners, let's leave it even bigger than that, learners who are often marginalized and not included. Um, we have to be respectful in our research. That's a mutual respect for what's there. Uh, it has to be work that's relevant to that particular community. We have to consider reciprocity in that if we're gonna draw research from these communities, what are we giving back as a sign of reciprocity and good faith? And the idea that we have a responsibility, not only in our roles, right, if we put the hat on as a university you know, student or if I have the hat of a university professor, um, what's my responsibility back to these communities? Um, I want to also impress the idea that justice, when we consider justice, it's one thing to have intentions that are justice oriented and it's an entirely different thing to have outcomes that are justice oriented. And so I'd like, really like to push that we be critical to understand that justice means outcomes, not just what the intentions are. How many families can we actually influence? How many daily lives can we actually help to increase that water uh, accessibility to? And so I'd really like to impress that in the work that we do, um, these are the ideas that remain central, that we be critical of what justice means, and that we be critical not only to enrich ourselves, but to give back to communities that we um, work with. And there's the reference if you're interested. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you have a few? We, we have a few minutes for questions and then perhaps a minute for you to give us a few final thoughts. Yes. Questions from the audience about the project in general? Any of the specifics? Uh, mine's directed at transportation. Um, uh, I know around this area with our Council of Governments that a lot of transportation set up on a urban rural model and you mentioned that transportation was very much lacking to the Colonius yes. and to me that seems like such a vital lifeline for the Colonius to be able to go into the urban area and for also urbanites to come out and maybe assist them in some sort of uh, thin line of uh, survival and that sort of thing. So if you maybe speak about, is there a strategy to bring public transportation to the Colonius? Uh, and on that topic, please. There have been um, several different projects that um, have been implemented. And we do have uh, rural bus service in different areas. One of the things that we see now is happening is that if you look at the Texas border, starting in Brownsville and working your way all along the river, all the way to El Paso, the, the population density is, uh, is the densest um, between Brownsville and Rio Grande City, Star County. So those uh, colonias there are experiencing less of a transportation problem because the urban transportation and the rural transportation are kind of mixing each other and, and it's available. The only problem is that as you go further north, traveling from Brownsville, the further up you go, the less dense the population, then the problem just becomes bigger and bigger. We've, we've had rural bus services that, that kind of start but is not profitable enough and or we don't get enough cooperation between the cities and the counties. Unfortunately, we get a lot of photo ops where everybody kind of puts their arm around each other and they all say, oh yeah, we're gonna cooperate, but city, city, county is county and there's always this line that divides everything. So once you try to implement a a uh, transportation program that's gonna either start in the city, go into, into the county, and then come back, guess who's the first one to complain? Public transportation. So it's gonna be very hard. It's gonna be very hard. I think there's time for one more question. 
Uh, thank you very much. At the beginning of your talk, you talked about the lack of water, sewage, and or more infrastructure issues. Yes. Is that lack of infrastructure due to a lack of governmental involvement or funding or otherwise? The lack of infrastructure has many um, starting points. The rural communities lack infrastructure because it went, um, the selling of, of, of raw land to vulnerable populations has been going on since the 50s. It wasn't until 1986 where the first law with any kind of teeth actually came into existence here in, in the state of Texas. Between 1986 and now, the state legislature has been trying to cover up all the loopholes because it, it, as soon as the, the law came into effect in 1986, outlawing the creation of any more colonias, there just was, it was too, too lucrative to pass up. So there was people that were finding ways of skirting the law. So right now we can more or less safely say that there, the number of colonias have not increased, but what we have is that the colonias are, For more information, please visit tlu.edu.